advice that, that you want to give? As an advice I, I can give to like young players and make sure that you're in a team that's right for you. The name of the org, the name of the players, it's not going to be as good as you being in the right team with the right players. Hey guys, my name is Avlox and I'm a professional Valorant coach. This series of podcasts is aimed at bringing knowledge to aspiring professional players in the Valorant scene and the wider esports scene. We talk to professional coaches, professional players, performance coaches, people that work in organisations to bring you the value that you need to become a professional player. Today we're talking to Apex's old head coach, Itopata, and is now Leviathan's assistant coach, about all the things that he needed to bring together one of the best teams that we've seen in Europe in a while, undefeated in the Polaris League. Itapata has so much knowledge from his years of experience both in Valorant and back when he was coaching Overwatch, really one of the most experienced coaches that I know, absolutely fantastic interview, packed with value, so well spoken, absolutely one you cannot miss. Sit back, relax and enjoy. So yeah, I mean I guess thank you for Thank you for joining me. That's my pleasure. I understand you have a really busy schedule. I see that you've even got your suitcase still behind you. So yeah, cheers. Oh, uh, I'm in the I'm in the casa facility right now. We're still like boot camping and everything. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I actually I wanted to start this interview a little bit differently and kind of take you back earlier this year to when you were playing with Apex, yeah. and I just wanted to kind of dive right in there because I feel like it's it's a obviously a really important place to start and i think for your storyline probably i think really like your big big break right i think that the thing that's really changed your career for for the better so turning up to ascension playoffs or, or whatever, whatever we're going to call them turning up at the coliseum being undefeated you know arguably the favorites for the whole thing how, how did you feel going into that uh i personally felt really comfortable uh confident i thought we we would win honestly and uh we were doing exactly what i was expected uh, i was expecting us to do problem is this this one game man this this one game that was the the big problem and yeah i mean i, I don't know what what else to say we we played brilliantly in the first uh, two yeah. games we made we made some mistakes we got punished for it we i, I think we learned from it uh, as well and we were even i felt even more prepared going into the finals uh but uh yeah and it's a, it's a different game the grand final let's be honest and we yeah, we weren't ready for that i think this is for, for me when it comes to kind of this this podcast and talking about high performance i think this is a point i've not really had the opportunity to discuss very much but i think it's a really important one where in esports or any any sporting event actually a lot of things can come down to a single moment right and how people react under the the really extreme pressure that, that that can be especially playing against a team like gentle mates i mean you know watching watching it watching the broadcast and the the crowds up there they're screaming you know i mean the gentle mates crowd were absolutely crazy in terms of their, their support do you think there's anything that you could do to prepare people for that um i remember that we tried to talk to the players a lot because even on the first day of the of the session LAN, we we were the se we were playing the second game. The first game was Ascend versus Gentlemates, and we were just in our uh, in our prac room, which was approximately like 20 meters away from the Gentlemate fans. Oh wow! So <laughs> we, we're like I don't remember if we were screaming or they were just playing ranked or something uh, when the when that game started. But Gentlemates, I think, won the first pistol, and then the whole ground started shaking around us and i just looked at magnum because he was sitting right next to me and and he he was he was proper scared like his eyes yeah he, there was fear in his eyes and i was like okay maybe we need to talk to, to them if we're gonna play against gentlemates mm. and the same thing happened when they were playing the lower final because we were still um we, we we decided we wanted to watch this game uh live we wanted to, to see like what the atmosphere is gonna be because if ascent won we already played against them we know how it is but if gentlemates won we were we knew that the, the crowd is gonna be a uh is is possibly gonna be a problem for us so 
Yeah, we uh, we we had a lot of talks about this. Like, don't uh, don't mind the crowd or like try to feed off their energy because obviously it's really good when there is a a crowd cheering against you and all of a sudden you shut the enemy team down. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know everything goes quiet. You know, oh, I've done my job. Like this feels good now. Uh, so yeah, we we had uh, we had a couple of talks, but we didn't really like had a I would say a proper plan around it. Um, we we kind of ignored the momentum that they, they can have. I think we like underestimated it. So mm. I think that was like our big big mistake in the in the grand final. Yeah, it's a really challenging one because I guess I've had this thought, you know, especially for for teams in VCT that want to find talent you know find people with raw talent and i think there's this kind of hoop that you have to jump through as a player that i mean i'm not sure i've quite put my finger on exactly what it is but this ability to be able to perform under that kind of pressure i mean that you know there's there's something like you know kind of like sitting an exam and and performing under that pressure but this i don't think anything really compares probably to what that what that feels like like you say the ground shaking i mean it's really like it's terrifying right really (laughs) And I just, uh, I guess, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. <laughs> no, so I guess my thought is, do you think there's any way that we can in the future kind of sc- scout for players like that? Mm, I think it's hard to hard to scout exactly for this in, in tier two, because, you know, yeah. almost almost everything is played on, on, on uh, online and... Yeah. I think only so, some of the final games are are played on on LAN, which is good. Like for example, the Spanish League, I, I know they have like insane finals, and this is really good for for the players. Um, but yeah, for for example, in Polaris, we we had a small LAN which was like 50 people. Most of it was like the girlfriends of all the players, uh, some family members. You know, it it wasn't like anything anything big, and still you could feel like there was pressure on every team there. Uh, even though we were like only three teams, but uh, yeah, there there was pressure on on everyone there. I think it was a different environment as well. Having been there, it was you know the the apex crowd was quite quite obviously the biggest one when it came to that event. So it was a bit of a switch up, I guess, to suddenly have you know a couple of hundred gentlemates fans screaming at you is definitely a a different vibe. Yeah, yeah. I guess um. Do you think then that it's only something that can be tested right that you you have to see players perform in that environment to know that they can do it uh yeah i think i think this is the only way like you actually need to experience it because it's it, it's different you know like for example I'll, I'll, i'm coming from football i've played against kind of big crowds you know i think it i've played against bigger crowds than what was in the in the coliseum yeah. and for me it was okay that, that, that's normal you know it's, it's just a little bit louder because it's a it's a closed environment and you know, it's not, nothing new for me. But then I can see that for some of the players, like even for example, Magnum, who played very big, uh, big games, he didn't play against uh, 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 in front of a crowd. So that yeah. you can see that he he was a little bit shook up at the at the start. But then he he like started playing better and better. Um, I think the crowd is it, it's something that uh, affects you at the start of the game, and then after some time passes, you. You, you kind of forget about it. You start you kind of get in your own flow and you you start playing around it. But I think for to answer your your question, yeah, you need to experience it firsthand and then you then then you can actually prepare for it. You know, because I think right now, especially in EMA, there's a lot of good players, a lot of talented players that never experience this. And I think this first season for them in VCT, it's gonna be it's gonna be a struggle because of the crowds. But after that, I I would expect they would do better. Yeah, it's a bit of an experience thing, right? You just kind of, you get used to it. And then, like you say, you can just play your normal game. It's definitely, uh, I think it's a big shift. Do you, you think when esports was kind of first becoming a thing, everything was played on LAN because the internet just wasn't wasn't good enough, right? So <laughs> yeah. actually you think of kind of like the old, the, the legends in, in CS, for example, you know, mo- most of them would have come up through small LAN tournaments where they would have played and kind of worked their way up. And everything, all of their tournament experience would have been played on LAN, almost all of it, right? So it's uh, it's interesting to see how this kind of there's this kind of change, um, in in the way that esports competition is played, because so much of it's online now. Uh, yeah, I mean, t- tier two, I, I guess it's it's hard to to make tournaments for like consistently on LAN for tier two. 
uh, I'm guessing there's not going to be that much uh, revenue for for every anyone. So yeah. that makes sense. But for example, now Valorant, everything in tier one is played on LAN. So, and I, I think in a couple of years, we're going to reach this level of CS uh, where the pros are just going to be like, yeah, it's just another day at the office, you know, mm -hmm. nothing, mm -hmm. nothing new. We, we know about the crowd. We know how to deal with it. We don't care about it. Yeah, it's one of those things where, like, you, I guess you'd like to see more support of, for it to, I guess, really see people show up, right? Because it's one one thing yeah. to obviously perform from your bedroom. It's another thing to perform in that room. And I think uh, it's something that I think I think some players would really shine through doing that. You know, it would, it would actually probably give players that you maybe otherwise wouldn't have thought of a, a shot at kind of like, you know, tier one. But Yeah, I, yeah, that's that, that's true. We'll see. We'll see as things move forward. Maybe the uh, as as the economics improve, we can we can only hope for for something like that. Yeah. I guess um, obviously the the gentleman's game wasn't just down to the the feeling in the room, right? And I'm interested to kind of hear your thoughts about their preparation for the game. It was quite clear that you know that they had really prepared to play against you. They, for them, I guess. From, from their point of view, you can certainly see it as, okay, we know we're going to play Apex in the final. Almost certainly, right? And I think probably every team that turned up there would have been prepared for that. Yeah, Do you think I their think... preparation was a big factor in that game? Um, yeah, I mean, they, they had good preparation. Um, there, there's an interesting story, actually. Like, Enzo spoke with Existence um, a couple of hours after the game. We were still at the arena. And Existence said that they were preparing for us for the last two weeks. Yeah. So they were ready for us. He uh, he had like a very big anti-strat uh, for every team there. Uh, we were seeing him with like going with uh, this stack of uh, this thick stack of uh, stack of papers <laughs> every time. And I think he had like really good preparation for everyone. We also had our preparation. Um, yeah, we just couldn't execute it on the day. And mm. I, I'm not sure how big of a factor it was like. For example, when on the on the first map, we uh, when we took the first pause, we we knew what they were anti strutting uh, about us. We knew uh, that, for for example, they they anti strutted really good how we we're playing our post plants on on A. So yeah. we had to we had to change it. It's just that uh, I think all of our brains were were not working properly on that day because nobody came up with a with an answer to this, and it's like. Looking, looking back at it, just rewatching the game, it's it's so easy to to do it, but you know, it's just the 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 pressure of the land that uh, that got to us on this day. Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, because watching it, watching it from the outside, it's like, wow, those A retakes are ten out of ten. It, it's it's yeah, almost we, we like never lose though. Like that's that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the reason why our heavens was so good. <laughs> yeah, then it's one of those things. One. It's it's hard to it's hard to make those pivots right because sometimes the simple solution can be like okay well look if we don't have a solution don't go A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we didn't. I know it's not really simple as that, like, but yeah. The the thing is, we we usually have this structure where uh, we had this structure at Apex where we we would um, me and me and Danito we we would like be really. Um, dig deep into the first couple of rounds and see, okay, are we anti strat or are we just playing against a team that's playing their own game? Because that, that really changes our game plan. And every time that we were getting anti strat uh, in the, the games before that, it, it was it was fine, you know? Like, we, we had we had a second game plan prepared and we were like, oh, there's a mosquito in my room, sorry. Um, and and we, were, we were ready to switch up and usually it worked at, almost every time. Um, this game, we, we like gave uh, I gave some pointers to the guys on the on the pause, but it really it really just didn't click. I, I don't know how how else to explain it. Yeah, I no, I mean as a, it's easy to relate to that as a coach, right? Where you say something, <laughs> you've you've understood the situation, and yeah. sometimes it's hard. I, I certainly find sometimes it's hard to know whether you didn't quite explain what you meant because you have sixty seconds to explain something that often is quite a challenging concept, or the players just didn't understand or something else the pressures get to go to them or whatever right there's because there's so many things that it could be attributed to right that there's so many different reasons why that could have happened uh yeah and um honestly we if we if we dig deep into it maybe we would understand that the thing is after the final it really didn't matter like we we lost we knew that everyone is 
everyone is getting poached. So for the team, there was no reason for us to go and rewatch this this like painful game to just yeah, of course. Figure out, oh, guys, this is what went wrong. Yeah, we could have done this better. But we would usually do that in, in every other game, because even the ones with, that we win, because obviously there's things to learn every, every every single time. It's just that after this one, we didn't really do that. There was no no point to do it. Yeah, that's a you come to a really good point. When you're winning throughout the whole season, does that put pressure on you to to really try and? you know, dig deep and try and find the, the really small mistakes that you're making, even when, of course, the, the opponents might not be punishing them? Um, I don't think it puts pressure on, on us. I think this was like part of our process. So we, we didn't really feel pressured about this. I think us winning every single game, it kind of like gave us wings. And uh, obviously we we put some fear into into the enemy because I, I don't think anyone wanted to play us, honestly. We, we were... We were really annoying to play against. Uh, even for uh, tier one teams, I had many coaches telling me that it's it's really annoying to play against us, and we were really happy with uh, what we're doing, and we just we just followed our process. Like it made us trust our process even more. It's one of those things as well. Interesting. My observation has generally been that it's not always about the team that does the best thing that matters. It's simply about the team that makes the least mistakes. Um, yeah, I would agree. So that's why our, our kind of like team motto was just, just, just play simple Valorant, you know, that you don't need to, you don't need to overcomplicate stuff. Uh, just make the simple call. Everyone follows it. Even if it's the wrong call, if you do it together, we, you, you win. Uh, we even had a, <laughs> uh, we even had a saying that, uh, you, you know, we had a kind of like a keyword for it, which was, uh, apes together strong. <laughs> 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 Uh, we, we were relying on this a lot, and we we actually we actually theorized a, a lot about it, how to do it properly, how mm. to minimize all the mistakes. So in the end, it was it was something that we were really good at. Yeah, I'm really sad that there wasn't another slot, you know, to see Apex play because I think you would have easily been middle of the table, you know. And when I know when you have some insider perspective on how organizations are being run on the back end and you have a very clear vision of how apex is being run you do i guess i i have this concern that there are organizations that are in there that clearly don't deserve it and apex definitely look like an organization that did um okay i'm sorry to all the leviathan fans uh, i i i know what i'm saying might sound controversial but Apex is the best org I've worked with. And th this is just saying I haven't been with Leviathan for that long. I don't know uh, I don't know how things are going to go during the season. But so far, I'm like really happy with Leviathan. But Apex is the best org I've worked with. I think they 100%, all the people there, they deserve to be in VCT. It's it's a shame that, that they're not. And I, I may, maybe I think it's for the better. I like to think it's for the better that um, after... Um, after some time, they're just going to get a proper slot, not just the guest slot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that would be that would be really good for the org, but they definitely deserve it way more than some orgs that are, are currently in VCT. So this is a point I have thought about a lot recently, actually, is the kind of mismanagement of a lot of organizations, right? I mean, it's very clear right now given the economic state of many of them i think that's that's quite a big thing but not not just up not just from that point of view but from a performance point of view what do you think it is based on your experience working with different organizations that really set apex apart in terms of their organizational structure you know above the team i think apex was the only org that knew how to properly build a team a team roster because from uh, when I was still on on TSM, we were we were like make, uh, we were trialing people after the um, after the news about VCT that they didn't make it, and even though I was in charge of this process, I didn't really like how it was made and what was happening, you know, behind the scenes. I didn't I didn't really like that. I didn't really like the influence some people have on the on those decisions, and then. I had a call with Apex at some point, and on day one, uh, I I just got told 
if you if you get put in charge, you're making all the team decisions. We just have a list of players that we want you to trial if you think they're and you need to tell us if they're good or not. And then we scratch them off or we we start talking with them. That was the only thing. And they gave they gave me full control over the trials. So we we were able to build this this roster which was insanely good for especially for tier two. It was it was the best roster, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. I have questions about that as well, but I guess this is this this is a really important question based on what you've said. How important do you think that building the right roster is? Oh, I think it's it's really important. I think there's um, a, a lot of teams right now that are built are not. How sh how should I say that? Hey, be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of teams that are currently that are built are. I feel like there is a lot of uh, nepotism involved, which yeah, is sure. which is really sad. I think it's it's not it's not something that we need to make a big deal of because sooner or later those things are gonna are gonna disappear uh, or at least they're gonna get minimized to a very small amount you know and i'm pretty sure in a couple of years there's only gonna be uh, players that deserve to be there and are not there because they're friends or relatives to somebody um but uh, yeah right now i feel like even the teams that are trying to to follow this this simple thing uh and just getting the best players i think a lot of teams are um ignoring how important the team chemistry is going to be and I, I don't think a lot of teams are are looking properly into that when they're doing trials it's a it's a challenge right because i think um so, some organizations maybe don't have the buying power that apex did to choose who they want do you think that's a factor oh, yeah that, that's definitely a factor like you you I've heard a lot of a lot of stories, even in VST, about all oh, this orc wanted this player, and you know, you you just know this player is gonna fit really good in there. But then he got an off, he got a way better offer from another team. So you're like, yeah, that not nothing you can do about that. You know, as a coach, all, all you can do is just sell your vision, sell your structure, sell your like whole process to the player, and then if he if he clicks with it, if he if he likes it, then maybe he chooses you over the other the other org. You, you bring a really great point here. Again, one that I think is a lot of players need to hear this. The best thing for your career, in my opinion, isn't always the biggest packet of money. Because if you go to a team that just has lots of money, that doesn't mean that it's the right team for you. Do you think more players should be thinking about that kind of thing? Um, it's a yes hard one, and, right? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean... Be, be, a couple of years ago, I would definitely like 100% agree with you, but right now it's it's a little bit different in my opinion, at least for me, because I think esports careers are like usually super short, and yeah. if if your name blows up at some point, sometimes it's really hard to keep to keep like this this flow um, that that you had one season. Sometimes it's really hard to keep it for another season, you know. So maybe sometimes it's better to to just grab the money you know and hope for the best um because obviously you're you're trying to like basically prepare yourself for life after the after esports during your whole career right so that's you can't you I, I feel like it would be bad to tell young players like no go 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 for winning every time like sometimes yeah you, you get the money you, you don't have a that good of a career but you're still like tier one player uh, on top of that uh that being said my mentality would always be just go for the best uh, go for the best roster make sure that you you're on a roster that you actually believe in and can win and um I just want to win, you know. That that's that was my mentality because obviously for coaches it's different. Like I can probably do this until I'm 50 years old or yeah. something. So I, I'm I don't feel time pressure uh, on me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I can. It, it's this is just, this might sound a bit strange, right? I have a conventional job, but I love esports, and I think I get paid enough money that one day, if I keep on doing this and I keep I keep on gaining knowledge and talking to the right people and working with teams that. But one day I, I've made enough money that I can quit and do esports for the love of it, right? Or, or if the right opportunity comes up, then 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 do that. And it's yeah, that's uh, the dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just I just the difference with coaches. I think you re you really can play the long game, right? There is no there is no rush. So, so back to my point before, 
I guess, from a slightly different angle. I think that some players sometimes rush into decisions about, oh, I've got a contract on the table. I must, I must take this. But they join the wrong team in doing so. I, I, I mean, I understand the windows for the, these things are quite short. So I'm interested to hear kind of more on your, more of your opinion, I guess, on that. How much weight do you think players should be putting onto choosing the right team, choosing the team that they believe in, the one that has the right culture, it's clearly got the right support, compared to, you know, I've got this offer on the table, it's probably fine. How, how, would, you, how would you advise someone that kind of balance? uh oh, this is a this is a tough one uh i feel like it, you need to make a clear distinction between tier two and tier one because sure, okay. for example uh for example this year there was a couple of players that were transitioning from tier two into tier one and i know they just they just took the first offer on the table and i can not blame them for this like you you got an offer from vct you go ahead and you take it there, there are other teams interested in you, but they're like taking their time. No, just just go ahead, take it. You're in tier one. That that's all that it matters. That's what you were you were fighting to do the the previous season. One way or another, you achieve this. You know, so just go ahead and do it. Now, if it's about tier two, then just choose the right org. That's the mm-hmm. most important thing. There are big orgs in tier two that you from the outside they look like oh it's gonna be such a such a dream come true to go into that org and then you go into a, into this org and it's like a dumpster fire you know like this org is just <laughs> destroying itself from within you don't you definitely don't want to do that but obviously it's even for very experienced people it's sometimes it's really hard to to see this because those those things that are happening within the org they're not going to be shown to you until you're in the org you know but for example, there are a lot of t- times where you know your contract is getting delayed, you're not getting answered on time for like months sometimes. You know, if that happens, that j- just keep in mind there is something wrong there. Like something is not working properly, and in the end, this is this is gonna cost you uh, and your team. Even mm-hmm. even if it's not like any anything team related even if you if you feel like your coach is really good even if you feel like all your teammates are good and you you're right about that if something in the management of the org is is going wrong you're gonna feel it at some point it's a real it's a real challenge yeah i mean it's interesting how my perspective has changed right i've the more i've talked to people the more i've kind of seen the bigger and bigger picture right? i thought do i actually want to do coaching or do i really want to solve the root of the problem right i mean for me this podcast is all about bringing up everyone in the esports scene right and the the root of the problem seems to be in some cases just uh, the people are running orgs and have no idea what they're doing whether it's whether it's through lack of experience or intentional ignorance is is still unclear i'm i'm yet to find some like real uh people like from organizations management that that are willing to come on but that's the goal is to go to that direction kind of have these kind of discussions because i think it'll be it'll be really interesting to kind of to kind of get into that I want to circle back to to a point that you made before that Apex was clearly the strongest roster are uh, kind of just looking at the players right based on their previous experience how how much influence do you think that 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 had you know do you think that if you had just sat there if you you personally had just sat there and done nothing how do you think teams will have the, the team would have gone just based on their experience uh I don't know, actually. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny question, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I think not that good because of the of timing-wise, because when we started scrims with the full roster, it was already January. And mm-hmm. this was two weeks before before we started uh, the, our, uh, our season. So, for example, we were playing against Fireflux a lot, and Everyone thought Fireflux is one of the one of the other favorites to win, and they were insane. You know, but they were just destroying us the first few days. It they were destroying us so bad that we actually on th- day three or day four uh, of the team we had uh, we had a team fight between two of the players. I'm not gonna name uh, anyone, but uh, we just we, I just had to step in. You know, so mm. I don't think this roster would have would have worked that well. 
because we started way too late with our preparation. Maybe if, if they were just working on their own for like a couple of months, then it would be it would be different. But the way everything uh, played out, I don't think without a without a proper coach, they would have they would have been that good. Yeah, this definitely isn't a slight at you. It's more of a kind of observation about how much impact do coaches have in general. Oh, because it's uh, I don't know. It's oh, a uh... philosophical question more than anything else. Right? <laughs> I think mean, obviously the organization and fixing interpersonal issues is obviously something really important. But I guess how much influence are you able to have on players that are quite experienced that have some level of ego right you know they, they believe in what they believe in they have quite strong views on, on certain things how much are you able to develop them and kind of en enable them in their career right enable their career growth obviously doing so well it's it's worked out for everyone <laughs> but particularly for like kiko right who didn't really have a huge amount of i guess experience coming into the team but for maybe the more experienced players like enzo how much difference i guess do you think you you made um i think i made a lot of a lot of difference for for everyone uh i think uh i think everyone was like lacking lacking for the fundamentals uh about the game or they they had different views of the fundamentals of the of the game and how it's supposed to be played so my job was just to teach those fundamentals or for the people that have them make sure that they align with everyone else so everyone is on the same page and like those crucial moments where like it's high pressure everyone just reacts the same way so we we just do things as a team um uh, but yeah it's sometimes it's it's really hard the code job uh in terms of that uh you know sometimes uh as you, as you mentioned there would be players with egos they would be players that are just not willing to learn you know sometimes they're just like there for the money you know mm. stuff like that um which yeah brings us to the previous point like we we just had to pick a team that um atmosphere wise and like personality wise was like fitting together and it was it, it all felt really good uh, so everyone had the same goal in the end uh we all wanted to to win ascension and yeah we just worked really hard for it the whole time it sounds strange you, you can probably relate to this but i think that there's some teams you just get in the room and you're like this is gonna work you know, like you can just feel that that mix of people will work. And a lot of the times, I think certainly in a lot of tier two teams, you can go in the room and be like, I don't care how much time you've got. Like this just this just won't work, right? Like it'll be fine. Maybe you'll perform quite well, but it's not, you won't achieve that level of excellence. I think that if you'd taken the time to choose the right players. Yeah, I I. I kind of agree with that and that's what that's why we had the trials like we we had days of trials where um so quick quick backstory about the trials it was uh uh magnum was the magnum was the first player mystic was the second player that we we wanted to pick obviously with mystic we had some problems and at some point he wasn't really trialing with us so it was just me and magnum uh for for like 100 percent of the time and there after after scrims every day when we were traveling we would stay um and talk for hour uh, two hours something like that and we we would always like discuss those things uh what you mentioned like okay with this player it doesn't feel like we have we have a good chance with this player it feels really good like mm -hmm. team synergy wise he was he had good communication he brought good energy that was the most important mm -hmm. thing um so we would discuss this thing this these things a lot and in the end we that was our goal. Just make a team that, in the end, when you when you spend six or seven months with them, cons like you're consistently with them the whole throughout the whole day, every single day, you need to make sure that you have good vibes with them. Otherwise, otherwise it's hard. Not gonna lie, it's gonna be really hard for you to make it work. Mm, this, I think there's a, there's a really key point here again for players is, what kind of skills do you think that they need to many of them need to go out and learn to be able to survive in this kind of environment because i think a lot of people don't have the perspective on what it's really like um you mean like a proper kind of environment or like a, an environment where you uh, i mean like a, a struggle you know if you're all gonna no, yeah ha, what kind of <laughs> skills do you think they need if they if they want to have something like apex did you know like outside of the game skills that that will make a difference to them um i think the most important thing is your go your personal goals align with the team goals um because obviously there are some teams that they don't want to win ascension they don't want to win champions you know they're, they're just happy where they are and the players are happy where they are and that that's that's 
honestly, it's it's fine. You know, you 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 just go ahead and do this. Uh, but let's say, for example, you get a a player like I don't know, let's say Durke, for example, or Aspas, because now I know how much this guy wants to win. You know, if you get Aspas on a team like this, bro, this guy is just gonna go, go crazy in in a, in a month when a team with a team that doesn't want to win. You know. And even if he's the best player, he's not going to perform to this level if he doesn't have four other people plus the coaches plus the org that have the same the same goal as him. I think that's a really important point, right? Is that this is this is why I mean we see it a lot, talk about it a lot. Maybe people aren't aware, but like that discussion right at the beginning of the day of like kind of what's the identity of the team, right? Who are we going to be? Who do we want to be? What are our values? Because if we aren't all pulling in the same direction you're going to end up unhappy, right? I mean, if there aren't kind yeah, of clear exactly. expectations at the beginning that like, we're going to do everything in our power to win Ascension from today. If, if Even if one person's like, eh, I'm happy, I'm happy here. <laughs> then, yeah, then it's just, it's just going to, it's going to cause a lot of friction. It's uh, yeah, then this guy doesn't put that much time into, into the game outside of scrims or he's the distracted during scrims. He like doesn't try hard every scrim and at some point it gets to everyone because obviously sometimes you just wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you yeah. you feel bad and then you go into a scrim and there is this guy just trolling your, your scrims and like wasting your time. Obviously you're not going to like it and mm. yeah, I think m most of the time it what happens is a roster shuffle. Like <laughs> you, you just go ahead and switch off that that guy. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy that we didn't we didn't have this problem at Apex, and we were able to keep the whole five during the whole turn uh, the the whole season. Mm. I wanted to just make another point as well on this fact that I think there are players out there that are extremely motivated that have maybe not made that decision. You know, certainly tier two or even tier three players that. You know, they're on a team and there's a load of guys that, like you say, they're just happy where they are. You know, they're happy to be top 1%, you know, or pro probably better than that if you're tier 3. Even realistically, it's probably better than that yeah, in the grand yeah. scheme of things. They're, they're great and they're happy to be really good. But that's not the same as wanting to be great, right? It's to wanting to have a legacy. Those are, like, those are much bigger words. They mean much bigger things. And I think maybe some players, I mean, I want to say this directly to them, that you have to realize that you're not going to get where you're going if you're not on a team where everyone's pulling in the same direction. And like you say, the really key point is to choose a team that has the same goals as you, because that's everything, right? Yeah. Okay, a bit of a change of pace. So <laughs> okay. things things end with Apex and it's it's time to look for another job and you get offered the assistant coach position at Leviathan how how do you feel about that like at the beginning you know before you've signed anything how do you feel about that transition from being head coach to to assistant coach and how do you see that kind of role change um so i yeah i had to really think about that because um you know i i had up, upsides and downsides on, on both decisions like I could have easily just stayed with Apex rebuild the roster and mm. you know there were there are already some leaks probably by the time this video is out we would know the full Apex roster but mm -hmm. I can tell you the roster is stacked again it's it's still like one of the best if not the best tier 2 roster so I can probably just go ahead and do the same thing again as a head coach or I just move on to VCT as an assistant coach and then see what happens from there obviously uh, in my heart, I'm still a, I'm still a head coach. But uh, that being said, my biggest factor in this decision was who I'm going to be working with as a head coach. Mm. Um, so for me, Goket is somebody I knew for two years before that. We were, we were actually so close to working together uh, a lot of times. <laughs> uh, so I was, um, I was really close to working with him and Kasse, but then obviously the mm -hmm. SM came and it's hard to say no <laughs> you know yeah 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 um then i could have worked with him and koi but then some things happened there so um i'm not going to go into details but yeah and then this this is the third time the the charm you know <laughs> yeah. uh, so goke is somebody that thinks a lot like me has the same goals like me and for for me like just knowing the, how the coach scene is in tier one, he is one of the very, very few people that I would trust to uh, be an assistant coach. And I know that this guy, he's going to do his job. And I just need to 
I just need to support them. I just need to fill in the gaps, which I'm I'm good at. Uh, I I think I'm good at, and I think the the team is is happy with what I'm doing right now. Uh, so for me, it was like, okay, if there is an offer here, I would I would take it. But if there is an offer from another team, I would really really consider taking it. You know, as an assistant coach, obviously. Mm. And how has your I mean, how has your role changed? What's different in what you do day to day? I mean. As an assistant coach, it's it's a lot more chill. You don't get all the pressure of uh, of being a head coach. You don't get all the pressure on the decisions on you. Obviously, from uh, tier two into VCT is it's very different. Um, your decisions are every single decision as a head coach you make is like it's getting it's it's getting um, how do you say that explored into details like you know oh why did he do that why why is he not picking this guy but this guy you know and yeah. we actually had this like uh, it, it, for everyone uh for everyone that, that doesn't speak spanish like everyone in the latin community was really really pissed at us because we we picked up non-spanish speaking players and mm. we're like chill guys it, it's okay you, you'll see and yeah you saw like the, the first tournament it, it already worked out really well for yeah. us um the team synergy is really nice. Like we were, again, all the things that we talked about up until now, both me and Gokhead are, are really firm believers of that. So we were we were building the roster in this way and the synergy felt great at the, in the trials. And now the synergy of the team is like really good. So how, how, do, you, how do you think it feels compared to Apex, the, the team environment? What's different, I guess? Yeah, I'm interested to know also, like, cause you know, there were very subtle differences, mm. I guess. <laughs> Um, well, first off, we don't have Shadow, which is <laughs> which is a big big difference because uh, Shadow is like the um, the funniest guy ever. Uh, he would um, he he is the only guy that I've seen in esports that never tilted. Like he was always positive. He was always like smiling, cracking jokes, and he would always bring the mood up. That's that's mm. really good, uh, in my opinion. Um, in in Levathan, we uh, I think. The players are more emotional, you know. It's um, it's Latin people. It's different culture, so it mm. it's more no. It's it's normal. Like um, if you compare them to Northern Europeans, obviously the more they are colder people, they're like more rational. They're um, they, they don't get tilted as easily. Mm. But I feel like the Levatan players are even when they get like tilted, they're really good at managing this on their own, and they they're able to bring up. Uh, they, they're able to come back and bring bring out a good energy again. And mm. from what I got told, this is really rare in the in the Latin community to have a player like this. And we actually have four players like this. So I guess we're we're really lucky about that because uh, we it, it will often happen when you know things are not going well in a scrim and we're like talking after and this guy says, oh, I was I was tilted, you know and I was like, oh, I, I didn't ca catch that, you know, like you, you played well, you still like gave out all, all the communication that you need to do. You still did, did your job, you know, maybe you didn't play that well mechanically because of it, but it wasn't like that noticeable. And for example, if you compare this to what would happen in Apex, sometimes there would be a player oh, I'm tilted and then he's like full silent the whole day. <laughs> Well, not the yeah. whole day, but the whole scrim, because then yeah. we would like talk about it between scrims. But for a whole scrim, he would like not communicate properly, something like that. Something would go wrong. Um, so yeah, I think those are like the small differences. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think they're quite big differences. It's, it's really interesting to hear, right? Because <laughs> I, I, I have some kind of some some people, I guess, wouldn't have that perspective, right? If, for example, if you haven't traveled a lot, you don't know how different people are in different places right if i yeah. if i hop on a plane to china people are very different if i hop on a chain to you know hop over to north america south america it's they're all different places different people it's um yep. it's affirming to kind of like hear that it's 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 true i mean it's observable in in a team environment like that that you these the bigger cultural impacts. I mean, it, it's one of those things almost that like uh, stereotypes exist for a reason, right? And they probably are more often than not accurate to some degree. Um, yeah, I would I would agree. So um, when we were building the team, we we actually talked about this a lot, like cultural differences. We need to mm -hmm. make sure like you can't just mesh two NA players with uh, three Latin people because 
uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work out most of the time. Um, we had to like, w when we were interviewing uh, and well, I wasn't really like interviewing because I wasn't officially with the team and mm -hmm. I, I was I was out of this process, but I know that that Gokit was like really digging into the personalities of all the MA people because, you know, it's it's a more laid out, it's a more chill region uh, in terms of personalities. Mm -hmm. um, even when I was at, at TSM, I could notice it, you know, like um, it, it's even when we're like losing scrims, for example, they would find something to laugh at. It's not gonna, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be that much. Oh, we're getting stomped. Something's not working. We need to fix it. You know, I need to, I need to focus up on this uh, or like I'm getting tilted because of this. Cause in Europe, it happens a lot where things are not working and you get tilted because of it. And even on the highest level. Um, and NA, at least in TSM, that didn't happen for me. But I heard a lot of stories uh, mm. of people that, you know, it, it it's just not working out personality-wise. And it was a lot of people that are like this in the scene. So we had to make sure that if we pick somebody, it's going to be somebody that's not going to, like, destroy the 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 focus of the group during the like the, those those hard months where you're, like, you know, you're on the verge. Sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not working. It feels like you're in a slump, you know, because um, every team has that. Um, mm. No matter how good you're doing, every team has that during some point of the season. And it, it's really important to have people that know how to deal with this so you can, like, get out of the slump and go back on go back on track and firing on, on 100%. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love what you said about the interviewing players because it's something that I think uh, you very rarely see in tier two, right? That there is, it'll just be a trial. There might be a, yeah. oh, we talked after the scrim. He seems nice, but there's no like, I've really tried to pick this person apart and understand their pain points, right? Because we, we look at, like you said, you talk about all the different people, different cultures, and they, they have their upsides, but obviously that comes at some cost, right? If you want to be more fun, more relaxed, then that's going to come at the cost of, well, I'm not going to be so, I'm not going to think through the problems, right? I'm kind of a bit more away from that. I'm not so worried about it. And so I'm relaxed. And so I can bring that relaxed energy. But at the same time, I'm a very rational, analytical, then I might get more tilted because I maybe don't have the answer to the problem. Or, you know, I'm, I'm really giving it my all, but someone else in the team isn't, you know, isn't quite pulling their weight today. And, and then I'm more tilted. And the, the psychology of that really interests me, right? I think that's something that I, like, I find really fascinating and like, interesting to talk about because everything comes at a cost, right? There's there's always some balance involved in in your personality, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it makes sense. Like you, you're no nobody is perfect, and yeah. going into interviews, going into picking up players, I I always know. Um, what at least from what they show in the trials because sometimes you know you don't have that that long of trials yeah uh i i have sort of an idea of like what's their weaknesses and i think that's that's even more important to me than what's their like strong points because st those weaknesses they're they're what they're what can break or make a team mm. in my opinion so I, I would always make sure that if we're picking somebody that's prone to tilting I would I would make sure that I tell the rest of the team that the, the rest of the players that are already on that roster. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you go with this guy, he people are saying that he's tilting. We saw him on the scrims, like when whenever things were not going that well, he was like getting quiet. You know, like obviously he doesn't want to tilt in trials, but he's he's hiding it, and you can still see see it sometimes. Yeah. So if we pick up this player, we need to we need to be prepared that this and this is is gonna happen. You know, and we need to know how to deal with this, and then we just make a decision you know if if we can deal with this in some way then that's fine just pick up the player because he's good uh but if we're not ready to deal with this then maybe it's better to go with somebody that's you think is like a little bit worse in terms of uh mechanical skills and aim but he is better um uh, and he is a better fit for the team i'm glad you circled back to that because i was thinking of <laughs> exactly this question that what it's often a, a challenge i think to 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 balance those things right because like you say you want someone that's pulling in the same direction that's aligned with your goals as a team but often you sometimes that will come at the cost of their 
maybe their mechanical ability or their experience is it yep. just about having a kind of plan in mind to uh, to kind of work on those weaknesses how do you kind of balance that i guess for you where's the hard cut off in terms of their attitude is shit i'm not gonna take that player <laughs> um hmm, that's a that's a good question um I think it depends on a lot of things. Like if it's a young player that they didn't have exposure before, maybe you can work with him. Like if you see that he's open to like feedback uh, during the trials and he's like improving on the things you're telling him, uh, yeah, just just take the risk. Like what was the worst thing that can happen? You know, <laughs> you you switch out a player mid mid season. But let's say it's a player that's been circling around in tier one for a while. He's been on a bunch of good orgs. You've all, you've heard that in every one, every single one of them, he had problems and he was getting kicked and everything like that. And then you try to bring it up with him, and he's like, you see that he's not willing to change. Then, yeah, you bring experience, but you're you're gonna destroy the team at some point. So I I don't I don't want that to be honest. I I I much rather go with somebody that's fresh coming uh, coming out of uh, tier two or something like th that's not proven but wants to prove himself and he he has like good mechanics and everything so i'm just gonna go with that guy so what about the other end where you maybe have the choice of someone that's very mechanically skilled but their attitude sucks or someone that you know isn't you know they're, they're gonna do what they need to but they're not really gonna like they're not gonna be sat back sight and kill four guys you know how do you how how do you because I, I think in tier two i definitely I, I definitely feel like that is a problem for for me to solve right is you know i don't have lots of buying power i don't have the the choice of the, the player that's got it all i have to make a sacrifice somewhere um yeah then it's then it becomes harder obviously if you don't have the the funding to do uh, to to get whoever you want but yeah, I, I can tell you, for example, this is what happened in, in Apex in the trials. We had one player that was like, mechanically, he was he was insane. He would have brought the level up really high. Mm -hmm. And then we had one of the team, one of the team members uh, on, on the other side, and we had to choose between the two of them. And we just we just knew that our that the team member, the team member is going to be way better for the team because he's going to bring so much more for the environment than the mm -hmm. mechanically gifted one that was like, you know, not not good mentality, like even tilting in, in the trials, that was like a very, very re a big red, red flag. Yeah, it's a challenge because I'm always one to say, it's, it's sometimes hard to find the cutoff, right? Because every, every situation is so unique and it's, every situation is different, even, even if you've That's been true. around for a long time. It's sometimes hard. It's something that I'm struggling with right right now uh, with a team yeah, that I'm I mean, helping out with. Ultimately, in the end, it, it it falls back to you as a coach and like your gut, your gut feeling on, on the situation. Um, this is something that I've been like trying to develop myself a lot, my, mm -hmm. my gut feeling and like trusting it. And, you know, those, those decisions, you actually need to review yourself as a coach a lot. Like, oh, uh, what what happened wrong uh, what went wrong here why why did i choose chose this guy over the other guy you know what if i have the same choice again am i am, am i going to do this and why why should i do or not do the same choice you know you need mm. to like reevaluate a lot as a coach uh, on those decisions mm. that's a really great point so looking into the future again how how are you feeling going into you know the next season of VCT <laughs> I mean, it's it's hard not to feel good, <laughs> honestly. Like um, we picked up a roster that from day one, people were like, "Okay, this this is a contender," you know. And then we go into uh, into Colombia and we're like completely destroying teams there, and it feels good. It, we we beat we beat three of the of the VCT teams there. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't lose a map, so it felt really good. And right now, everyone is like, uh, everyone can feel it, you know, like. There, there is something, something here in this team that's, that's like gonna, gonna bring us to the international stage, and mm. we, we want to like work on that. Um, we're, we're still keeping our focus, obviously. Like we're not like, oh, we're, we're in masters already, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. um, but we're all motivated. I think what, what I mentioned earlier, it's really important. Everyone has the same goal. We all want to, to win champions, and that's like, that's gonna be, that's gonna be what we're after this season, and. 
everyone is working hard for it right now. So I'm I'm really happy, and I'm pretty sure everyone else is really happy with with doing that right now. Yeah, I'm really I'm really excited to see where your where your where your journey goes with with Leviathan. I really hope to see some some big things. So we've been cooking up some things. It's gonna be fun <laughs> when when we go on the stage. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. So yeah, I, I just want to thank you again for your time. And I guess if there's any final parting advice that that you want to give, then please please do or, or shout anyone out. Then that'd be great. Um, let me think. First off, shout out to all the to all the Leviathan fans. Um, I think this is the first interview I'm doing since uh, I joined the team, and I I absolutely love all the support we got in uh, in Colombia. That was that was actually insane. Seeing all the all the people there cheer for us, I wasn't expecting the the Latam community to be this this crazy like good crazy you know <laughs> I was like blown away it's it's actually amazing and I'm I'm really happy to be part of this uh, of this family um, and um, as a as an advice I, I can give to like young players and aspiring coaches like just um, just follow what what I just said in this this uh, this whole thing um, make sure that you're in a team that's right for you because sometimes the the name of the org the name of the players it's it's not going to be as good as you being in the right team with the right players and improving um on your own pace great thank you so much ito cheers thank you